Well, greetings, brethren. It's good to be able to be speaking with you today in this way. I would like to ask a question at the beginning of this sermon, and that is, are we living in the last days? Are we living in the last days? This is an important question for those who will be living in the last generation before Christ's return. Uh, it's not an unfamiliar question. I think those of you who have been around for some time, uh, certainly this is something that you're familiar with. Uh, we've had articles and sermons in the past. Dr. Douglas Winnell uh, had a sermon of the same title back in May and June of 2001. Dr. Meredith also, uh, back in 2004, had a sermon of the same title. Uh, so let's talk about this question, are we living in the last days? First of all, it is worth mentioning that this phrase, uh, these last days, has been used by the uh, disciples, by the apostles, even in referring to their time. Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 2, Paul writes, in these last days. Uh, so certainly he was considering the time that he was living in, in other words, the, let's say the New Testament age, to be within the general scope of the last days. Also, Acts chapter 2 and verse 17, uh, Peter said, in the last days, uh, talks about in the last days the Spirit being poured out, and he was referring it to what happened on the day of Pentecost. So, in one sense, the time ever since Jesus Christ uh, came the first time is the last days, but of course, as we get closer to the return of Christ, uh, there will be a time specifically that is just the, uh, the time immediately before Christ's return, and, and certainly we're getting closer and closer to that time. Let's turn over to 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 1. 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 1. This is a familiar passage. When we think of the, the last days and the last generations, just, just prior to Christ's return, we read in uh, 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 1. Beloved, I now write to you this second epistle in both of which I stir up your pure minds by way of reminder that you may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets and of the commandment of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior. Knowing this first, that scoffers will come in the last days, walking according to their own lusts and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. So Paul, or Peter rather, was inspired to say something about 2,000 years ago, less than 2,000 years ago. And he said, don't be disturbed, even though you approach, even when you approach the last days. Peter was inspired to say this almost 2,000 years ago. And basically saying that don't dis be disturbed when people come and are cynical and they say that, well, everything is just going to continue as it always has. And even if that happens right up at the very end, he said, block out the noise and rather look at what the Bible really says. Now, of course, without setting dates, without boxing ourselves into a corner, we can understand the broad brush of what God is doing and the signs that are going to be uh, there just before his return. Now, there are many signs we could talk about. Certainly, Mr. Meredith, uh, the booklet, 14 Signs Announcing Christ's Return, uh, discusses that. But for the sake of the sermon today, I'd like to limit it to several things that we can really quantify, let's say, and, and please give me... Uh, appreciate uh, the, a little bit of poetic license to, to do what we can to uh, quantify some things and maybe focus on those a little bit and looking at some evidence that can help us understand where we are in prophecy, even that we are in the last days. So we'll look at a few slides and some graphs that I've made, and one of them is uh, related to... 
the threat of global nuclear annihilation. Number one, the first piece of evidence that we're living in the last days now is we're living under the number one threat of global nuclear annihilation. I think we would all agree that one of the biggest pieces of evidence that we are living in the last days is simply the fact that we really do have the capacity today to annihilate all human life through nuclear war. Uh, Matthew chapter 24 and verse 21, let's turn over there. Matthew 24 and verse 21. We read here in the uh, Olivet Prophecy, Matthew 24, verse 21. For then there will be great tribulation, such as has not been since the beginning of the world until this time, no, nor ever shall be. And unless those days were shortened, no flesh would be saved. So Jesus was saying that there will come a time at the very end when warfare will be so bad and famine and pestilence and all of that combined that every human being on earth would be threatened. Now we've never had that potential until the 20th century. And let me show you a, a graph that describes the explosion of destruction and the explosion of destructive weapons uh, throughout history and especially in recent days. If you look at the graph, <clears throat> goes back to, let's say, roughly 4000 BC, and uh, you'll see that uh, gunpowder was invented in around 900 AD. Then we find in about 1863 that TNT was accidentally invented. That apparently uh, it was by a scientist who was uh, experimenting and trying to come up with a new dye for coloring uh, 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 clothing or, or fabric, that sort of thing. Uh, but he accidentally created TNT. That, I'm sure, was a little bit shocking for him. Then we come to 1945, of course, the first atomic bomb being dropped. And uh, that was over Nagasaki and it equaled 22 kilotons of TNT. Now, it's inter interesting that ever since TNT and dynamite were invented, then our bombs are related to the force of TNT. So, for example, this atomic bomb in 1945 released enough energy that it was equal to 22,000 tons of TNT. Now, that's quite a jump from 1863. But if you'll notice on the graph, it doesn't even come close to registering because there's a huge spike in the 20, later in the 20th century. Notice around uh, the year 2020, uh, this was um, a statistic that I looked up. It, it is referring to the B-83 nuclear bomb it is equal to 1.2 megatons of TNT, and it is 60 times more powerful than the Nagasaki blast. It's, um, it's interesting that we have uh, weapons that are so powerful, they're so much even more powerful than one that was dropped in 1945, and uh, th this is not just the only bomb, the B-83. The U.S. has 650 of those bombs. And, of course, there are other types of nuclear weapons. All told, the world has about 13,000 nuclear bombs that are operational. Now, how many nuclear bombs would it take to wipe off life off this planet? Uh, there are some estimates that, that the experts say that if one country launched over a hundred nukes at another, uh, there, that essentially would lead to the devastation of a whole whole region, a whole uh, a whole continent. By the time there was the, the the response from the other country. Now, why is this important? Well, because the generation that lived under the Cold War was very cognizant of the fact that. Uh, this issue with Russia and the United States in the Cold War, uh, 
that they were living under the threat of nuclear war. But by the time we get to our year now and our time, whether it's 2022 or 2023, uh, it's been almost 80 years since the first atomic bomb was dropped. And it can give us a false sense of security that since nuclear Armageddon hasn't happened yet, it won't happen. And yet you know the news that we perhaps are in the most dangerous time ever in terms of nuclear war. Uh, Vladimir Putin has been threatening and implying, certainly, about using nuclear bombs in the war in Ukraine. And so we're very, very, we're living on the knife's edge. And uh, we should not have a false sense of security that this is never going to happen. Does that mean we despair? Does that mean we have no hope? Of course not. Notice back in Matthew 24 and verse 22. It says, unless those days were shortened, no flesh would be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days will be shortened. Isn't it interesting that in this, uh, speaking of this time, when he says that you're going to have the potential for nuclear Armageddon, and in fact, there will be the worst time of trouble ever, but it's not going to wipe out everyone because of the elect, because of the church, because of God's people. He's not going to allow everyone on earth to be destroyed. We know there will be great devastation. But there will be those who live in a place of safety. Uh, there will be others who live on through all of the, the events we read of and the great tribulation and the day of the Lord. Because God will stop it short from annihilating every human being. We're, we're living in a unique time though, and that's the point. We're living in a unique time and we can see that in the graph. Let's think about another um, another piece of evidence that shows we're living in the last days, and that is number two, the dramatic increase of speed of transportation. Let's turn over to uh, Daniel chapter 12 and verse 4. Daniel chapter 12 and verse 4. We read some very interesting things here. It says, but you, Daniel, shut up the words, seal the book until the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall increase. Interesting that Daniel was not allowed to understand the, the prophecies that he was being given, but it would be understood in the time of the end. What was one of those things that was to be prophesied? Many shall run to and fro. Fro. What does that mean? In its most uh, basic definition, that means that there would be uh, a speed of transportation that would, would jump off the, the charts. If you think about it, what do, you, what do we see today? Well, for, for thousands of years, the top speed of mankind was about 55 miles an hour on horseback, uh, give or take. Uh, but what do we see today? Of course, in the 19th and 20th centuries, we, we know that trains and, and automobiles and eventually planes and even rockets were developed where a man or a woman can travel at, at many times the speed that people typically travel throughout all of human history. The last space shuttle launch in 2011 reached an orbit speed of 17,500 miles per hour. So I've plotted that on the graph here just to show just how dramatically this speed has increased in just a short time. Are we living in an unusual time? I think that's the point. That's the question. What about another piece of evidence right here? As it says in Daniel chapter 12 and verse 4, many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall increase. Knowledge shall increase. We've talked about this and, and heard about it before, but take a look at the graph 
Uh, the author Buckminster Fuller came up with the estimate in 1982 uh, that uh, talking about the doubling of knowledge and how uh, he estimated that up to 1900, knowledge had in the world doubled about every 100 years. By 1945, that had sped up to once every 25 years. By 1982, knowledge was doubling once every 12 to 13 months. And now I think the estimate is knowledge doubles about every 12 hours. So I've tried to plot this on the graph and in as much as, as I can in, in trying to quantify these in that way. Now, I don't think uh, he's meaning by that, or we should assume by that, that, that uh, everyone today is so much smarter than they were in the past. Uh, certainly, there are tremendous advances in, let's say, biology and you know, nanotechnology and uh, genetics and that sort of thing. But I think we also understand that a lot of what this, this knowledge explosion is simply uh, data and information, and we can see that in our world today. Uh, the latest count of data in the world is 44 zettabytes of data, and that is uh, 44 sextillion bytes of data in the world. That means 44 with 21 zeros behind it. So no matter how we look at it, we're living in unusual times, and that's what was prophesied by Daniel. Let's get a little more context to these times we're living in. If we go back to Daniel chapter 12 and verse 1, he says, At that time Michael shall stand up, the great prince who stands watch over the sons of your people, and there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation, even to that time. Well, that's interesting because we just read in Matthew 24 about the worst time of trouble ever and it being related to the end time, time of just before Christ's return, here we see another reference to that same time. Now, there cannot be two different times that were the, the worst time ever. It has to be talking about the same event. So this is talking about the Great Tribulation, just as Jesus was talking about it. And... Um, so he, all of this is context of the time just before Christ's return. But notice, he says, uh, again, there will be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation to that time. But at that time, your people shall be delivered. Again, do we despair? Do we lose hope? Of course not. Because as we're going to see, as we look at these signs of being in the last days, we also see great comfort and encouragement and assurance for God's people. It says, And many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, some to shame and everlasting contempt. Those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the firmament, and those who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. So even a hint of the work that God will be doing through his church at the end times of helping to spread the gospel message, helping to spread the good news of the coming kingdom of God, as well as the warning message, and many turning to righteousness, and those who are a part of that will be blessed forever in the resurrection to live in, glor in a glorified state. That's what he's talking about in the end times as well. So there's, there's something very powerful for those of us and very exciting for those of us who God has called to be in this work today. There's a reason for living. There's a purpose to our life. There's meaning in our life. You know, so many people out there in the world are searching for meaning in their life. And more and more of them are, are finding that search turning up empty. Brethren, we have an opportunity to show them what the meaning of life is, and that's powerful. And that's where we are right now. That's, we are living in the last days, in this last generation that is going to face these things. Let's look at another piece of evidence that we're living in the last days, and that would be uh, number four. 
So number three was the, uh, the knowledge explosion. Number two was the uh, increase of transportation. Number one was the rise of the threat of nuclear annihilation. Number four, the rise and collapse of the Israelite nations. Let's turn over to Genesis chapter 49. Genesis chapter 49, and we read here in um, this really, really interesting prophecy by the patriarch Jacob, whose name was changed to Israel. Genesis 49 and verse 1, Jacob called his sons and said, Gather together that I may tell you what shall befall you in the last days. Interesting. He didn't say what will happen to your children, grandchildren, great-great-grandchildren. He said, I'm going to tell you what's going to happen in the last days. Now, what does that phrase refer to? In the scriptures, it's talking about the time just before the Messiah returns. And then he goes down and, and, and gives a lot of detail for all of the sons of Jacob. But let's turn, let's look at specifically the son named Joseph. Verse 22. Joseph is a fruitful bough, a fruitful bough by a wall, by a well, rather. His branches run over the wall. Speaking of a colonizing people, uh, uh, people that would spread out all over the world, talks about their military might. And finally, verse 25, by the God of your father who will help you. And by the Almighty who will bless you with blessings of heaven above, blessings of the deep that lies beneath, blessings of the breasts and of the womb. The blessings of your father have excelled the blessings of my ancestors up to the utmost bound of the everlasting hills. They shall be on the head of Joseph and on the crown of the head of him who is separate from his brothers." So Joseph, whoever Joseph was and, and would be, was prophesied to be blessed beyond any of the others, uh, beyond, beyond, frankly, belief, if we think about it. Now, let's talk a little bit about the way, what our life is like uh, compared to the life of the average person over the centuries. You know, when you think about the wealth that we have, an abundance that we have in the Western nations today, let's say in particular the United States, but also the other Western nations that are either descended from uh, Jacob and Joseph in particular, uh, or are, were, were ruled over by uh, Joseph, uh, by uh, Jacob and his descendants, and were blessed because of their association, uh, whatever way we look at it, we have been blessed a lot. When you, when you look at the average person and what they lived on for all of human history, virtually, it's really pretty striking. Uh, there are experts that have come up with a, a rough estimate of the average yearly income of, of the typical person throughout history. And it's uh, roughly $600 uh, GDP per capita throughout all of human history. And, and, and they, they figure that also uh, taking into account inflation, et cetera. So uh, it's roughly, it's comparing apples to apples. It's comparing real dollars back then to real dollars today. That's the average yearly income that uh, the average person has lived off of throughout human history. Now, frankly, it's even worse than that because uh, that's sort of the cutoff. Uh, as they, as the, the researchers that came up with this figure say, those who lived on less than that typically didn't survive. So in other words, this was the, the bare minimum they needed to survive just to eke out a living. How does that compare with our day to day? Well, according to statistics, Around 1800, the average USA GDP per capita income was $1,980. And then by 2016, the average United States GDP uh, gross domestic product, that's, well, that means per capita income, meaning per, per household, was 90 times the historical average around the world, $1,980. 
uh, and that comes to about $53,000. Now think about that just for a moment. You know, we who are living in the Western world, especially this world, this country in the United States, it's easy to think that, well, this is normal, that what we have around us, and we, we don't think of ourselves as rich, but what we have around us is normal and it will last forever and it will always be this way. And yet when we think about it and really compare our lives with what the lives of the average person has been throughout human history, and even many people who are living right now on this earth, we are blessed beyond measure, beyond estimation. Now, the point is not to, that we should feel guilty about that. Uh, the point is that we have to understand we're, we're living in the land that was blessed because of the obedience of Abraham and because of the promises and faithfulness of God to him. And we've been the recipients of that. Now let's go over to Jeremiah chapter 30 and verse 1. Because just like uh, Israel would be lifted up high in the end time, in the last days, that's what Jacob said in Genesis 49 verse 1. We also see because of disobedience, because of rebellion, Israel, modern day Israel would be brought low. Jeremiah chapter 30 and verse 1. The word came that came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Thus speaks the Lord God of Israel, saying, Write in a book for yourself all the words that I have spoken to you. For behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, that I will bring back from captivity my people Israel and Judah, says the Lord. And I will cause them to return to the land that I gave to their fathers, and they shall possess it. Now these are the words that the Lord spoke concerning Israel and Judah. Now again, we have to understand that the Jews today do not encompass the two houses, the house of Israel and the house of Judah. The Jews today are primarily from uh, the house of Judah, those who came back from Babylon after the Babylonian captivity. But the ten tribes that went into captivity uh, through the Assyrians, they never came back. They never went back to the land. So they went somewhere else. And yet this is a prophecy by Jeremiah to both houses. And as we're going to see, it's relating to the time of the end. What does it say? Thus says the Lord, we have heard uh, a voice of trembling, of fear, and not of peace. Ask now and see whether a man is ever in labor with child. So why do I see every man with his hands on his loins like a woman in labor, and all faces turn pale? Alas, for that day is great, so that none is like it. Are we looking at another reference to the worst time of trouble in human history? That's what that is talking about. The third reference to the tribulation. You don't have multiple places that talk about the worst time in, in uh, human history, a day that there is none other like it unless they're speaking of the same time. That day is great so that none is like a time, a time of warfare, a time of fear, a time of, of great distress. And it is the time of Jacob's trouble. Why do we have to identify who Jacob is? Why do we make so much effort into proving and showing and, and, and understanding and looking at the, the evidence that the modern houses of, uh, uh, of the modern nations of Joseph and Jacob at large are to be found in the English-speaking world and, the, and Northwestern Europe as well? Well, because the time of the tribulation is particularly targeted toward those disobedient nations that sprang from Jacob. It is the time of Jacob's trouble, but he shall be saved out of it. For it shall come to pass in that day, says the Lord of hosts, that I will break his yoke from your neck and will burst your bonds. Foreigners shall no more enslave them, 
but they shall serve the Lord their God and David their king whom I will raise up for them. So here's another clue that this is clearly talking about the end times because it leads right into the resurrection, a time when Jesus Christ will be living and reigning on this earth and David is going to be the king over the nation of Israel. Well, today David is in the ground. He's been in the grave ever since he died. So this could only be speaking of the time right around the resurrection that, that in Christ's return. And just before that, the tribulation and all of these things happening. So the point being that we have been blessed so much... As the chart points out, 90 times the historical average. And yet our nations, are, our Western nations, are going to be brought down all the way to captivity. What does that feel like? What does that look like? I think that's going to be shocking. And I think for, for all of us as well, the point is that not to assume that the abundance and the material blessings that we have had, even in our lifetimes, are going to continue forever, because they won't. There's coming a time when God is going to uh, punish mo the modern house of Israel for their sins. Now, can we see any pattern in these graphs? Is there any relationship between the first and second and third and fourth graph? Well, I think you can see it's obvious. That in so many ways, in, in different ways we can measure, uh, life has been fairly constant and consistent for thousands of years, and then the 20th century, and now the 21st century, it just goes off the charts. There's something different. We're living in a unique time. We're living in a different time. This is not like any other time in history. And if, you, if we have discernment, then we can connect the dots and, and see that we're living in the time just before Christ's return. Now, we're not even talking about some of the other uh, proofs and evidence uh, of the last days, like the rise of Germany or uh, you know, the, eventually the abomination of desolation and, and those sorts of things. But, but what I'm trying to point out here are some quantifiable elements that you can even put on a graph that can help us to see that we're living in unique times. Let's go to another one. That is number five, the coming of the Philadelphian era. One of the fundamental understandings of Bible prophecy uh, also involves church history. Uh, we read in Revelation 2 and 3 about the seven church eras that would come to pass. Now, uh, as we have been taught, uh, every church area, era uh, should take the warnings of all of them. We can learn from all of the, the warnings, but they are also prophetic in nature. So uh, there are time periods that apply to different ones of the church eras. Let's turn over to... Uh, Revelation chapter 3 and verse 7. Revelation chapter 3 and verse 7. And this is the message to the church in Philadelphia. Revelation 3 verse 7. And the, to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These things says he who is holy, he who is true, he who has the key of David, he who opens and no one shuts and shuts and no one opens. I know your works. See, I have set before you an open door, and no one can shut it. For you have a little strength, have kept my word, and have not denied my name. So when we think about the era that this applies to, um, it doesn't take a whole lot of uh, discernment to see that this was essentially the, the era of Mr. Herbert W. Armstrong. Let's look at another graph. It's interesting to note that the impact of the work throughout history, throughout the last 2,000 years, um, most of that time, the work has been, been just at a low ebb. Now, early on in the first, first century, let's say, there were 
uh, perhaps tens of thousands of brethren who were a part of the church, who are a part of the, the true church. We read in Acts chapter 21 and verse 20 uh, that uh, it says uh, that uh, many myriads of Jews believed and were zealous for the law. The word myriad means a, a group of 10,000 people. So if there were many myriads, there would be tens of thousands of people. So we don't exactly know the impact of the work at that time, uh, but it may have been very, very significant. But since that time, since the end of the first century, what do we see? Well, we see um, essentially a low ebb until the 20th century century when the knowledge explosion and transportation and communication explosion uh, led to ultimately uh, Mr. Herbert W. Armstrong, uh, God leading him to uh, revive the work in 1933. He began broadcasting on radio, ultimately on TV, using technology that was uh, extant in, in the last days. And um, Ultimately, uh, the Plain Truth magazine, before his death, uh, was just over 8 million subscribers per issue. Now, just to put that into perspective, uh, back in 1983, several years before his death, uh, the three big weekly news magazines in the United States were Time, Newsweek, and U.S. News and World Report. The uh, Time uh, Times circulation, paid circulation, was 4.6 million. Newsweek's paid circulation was 3 million. A U.S. News and World Report, uh, their paid circulation was 2.1 million. And in 1983, the subscription of the Plain Truth magazine was just over 3 million. So I say that just to emphasize the fact that the work that Mr. Herbert Armstrong was doing and many of you were a part of, was significant and was making an impact in this world. Now, did every last person hear the gospel? Did it, did it go to every last country around the world and, and reach to really saturate the world? Um, no, but it still did make an impact. And sometimes for, perhaps for those who have come since then, it, it's helpful to understand just how powerful this work was and just what God was doing uh, at that time. Let's turn over to Matthew chapter 24 and verse uh, 14. Matthew chapter 24 and verse 14. We read here that um, even in terms of evidence of, of the end times, the last days, Matthew 24, verse 14, And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations, and then the end will come. Well, the end is not yet, but the gospel is being preached in a powerful way and has been in the 20th century and continues to be now um, in, in ways that were never possible in the Middle Ages or in, you know, the 1700s, uh, etc. Now, going back to uh, Revelation chapter 3, because we also see that after the Philadelphian era, we see an era that uh, has a very, very uh, different attitude, by and large, the, the predominant attitude of that era. And that, of course, is the warning to the Laodiceans, uh, a general direction away from doing the work, by and large, uh, from taking the gospel to, to the world. Um, and, and I think, in general, we would, we would see ourselves as uh, being a part of, and in the, in, in the time period of that last era, the era of Laodicea, we don't have to have the spirit of Laodicea, but it certainly appears that we are living in the last era today. We don't have 8 million subscribers, uh, but the work is still going on. The doors are still open. New people are being called uh, all the time. Uh, frankly, the potential to reach uh, 
uh, people is greater today than it was even under Mr. Herbert Armstrong. Now, the internet, of course, is that tool. And certainly there are so many voices on the internet and, and so much noise on the internet that it can crowd out the message, but that is certainly the potential today to reach even more. And we do have some encouraging statistics that, uh, for example, in some of our messages, some of our YouTube stations, for example, uh, the English Tomorrow's World YouTube station, we have over 20 million views. Uh, the French YouTube station, over 4 million views. The Spanish YouTube station, uh, over 59 million views. A number of our telecasts also have gone over 1 million views themselves. Um, there's a Tomorrow's World whiteboard entitled, This is One Sin That Cannot Be Forgiven. That in itself has 1.1 million views. Um, Ezekiel's message unlocked, that telecast uh, was changed uh, in name to Ezekiel's messages for our world today. That's had over a million views. And uh, there's another one entitled, Jesus is Coming, Are You Watching the Signs? That's from a telecast. Uh, seven signs signaling the second coming of Christ. Uh, that's had almost two million views. So the potential to, to reach even more people is there. And uh, certainly in the work today, we're doing our best to, to try to, to strive to accomplish that and finish the work. But let's look back in uh, Revelation chapter 3 and verse 10. Because it relates even to what we've been talking about earlier about the worst time of trouble ever. Here in Revelation 3 and verse 10. Because you have kept my command to persevere, I also will keep you from the hour of trial which shall come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. So here's the fourth reference to the great tribulation in relation to events that are nearing the, the time of Christ's return. But in this case, he talks about how God is going to keep those who are his faithful and zealous people, who are going through open doors, who are striving to be faithful to his word and accomplishing his will and doing his work in the end times, in the last days. The point is, our time is unique. And we can even plot it on a graph in that sense. And again, it... It takes a, a little bit of poetic license to, to quantify these things, but, but think about it. Think about the pattern that we're seeing and understand that is, is our time really just like it always has been? Is it just cycles that happen over and over and over? Well, no, you have to have a little discernment, but um, it's getting more and more obvious, frankly, that we are living in an unusual time. Let's look at one more, one more point about our day, and that is the end of 6,000 years. The end of 6,000 years. Edward Gibbon wrote in the history of the decline and fall of the Roman Empire, he said, the ancient and popular doctrine of the millennium was intimately connected with the second coming of Christ. As the works of the creation have been finished in six days, their duration and their present state, according to a tradition that was attributed to the prophet Elijah, was fixed to 6,000 years. By the same analogy, it was inferred that this long period of labor and contention, which was now almost elapsed, would be succeeded by a joyful Sabbath of a thousand years. And that Christ, with the triumphant band of the saints and the elect who had escaped death, or who had been miraculously revived, would reign upon earth till the time appointed for the last and general resurrection. Now, what does this mean? Well, it, it means that there would be roughly 6,000 years from the time of Adam and Eve being created to the return of Jesus Christ. And if we look at the genealogies, if we look at chronology, from the time of Adam through Noah and through Samuel and David and finally the apostles and Jesus Christ and to our time. 
We cannot say for certain uh, down to the year where we are um, because there always are, uh, are certain discrepancies in, in, in calculating years and, and, and uh, chronologies and, and genealogies, that sort of thing. But we can be pretty close. And the point is that we're, we're getting close uh, within a certain uh, uh, plus or minus. We're getting close to the end of 6,000 years. There's an interesting book that um, is entitled The Fourth Turning. Uh, it, it, it basically talks about um, cycles of war, cycles of economic boom and bust, and, and roughly gives the theory that there's an 80-year cycle. When you look at history, down through history, um, that uh, sort of goes through this cycle. And um, it's interesting what the authors said back in 1997, because they were predicting a sort of the, the crisis to, uh, to occur, uh, the end of the so current cycle that we're in, uh, sometime in the 2020s. Uh, the author says, if the crisis catalyst comes on schedule, then the climax will be due uh, in the 2020s uh, what will America be like as it exits this period? History uh, offers no guarantee. I'm sorry, as it exits the fourth turning. In other words, as it's in this period of time in the 2020s, this decade. History offers no guarantees. Obviously, things could go horribly wrong. The possibilities range from a nuclear exchange to incurable plagues, from terrorist anarchy to high-tech dictatorship. It is kind of interesting, the, the, the things that the author pointed out way back in 1997, uh, just the possibilities of things that our world could be experiencing. And, and frankly, we're experiencing more of that in the last few years. Going on, they say, we should not assume that providence, or that is God, that is the one who uh, watches over us, will always exempt our nation from the irreversible tragedies that have overtaken so many others. Not just temporary hardship, but debasement and total ruin. Since Vietnam, many Americans suppose they know what it means to lose a war. But losing in the next cycle, however, could mean something incomparably worse. It could mean a lasting defeat from which our national innocence, and perhaps even our nation, might never recover. As many Americans know from their ancestral backgrounds, history provides numerous examples of societies that have been wiped off the map, ground into submission, or beaten so badly they revert to barbarism. My point is, there are some people who, who even though they're not a part of the church, they're looking at world events, and especially today. This was back in 1997. But especially today, there are secular experts out there who are, who are saying that we are really, really in for a rough road ahead. And things are different, and things are unusual, and things are unique, and we'd better sit up and, and take notice. Now, why does this all matter? Let's go back to Second Peter once again. Second Peter... Once again, it's interesting that uh, this is a totally different study, but uh, it's interesting how God points to Noah and Lot as uh, their societies, uh, they were living in the time just before their societies were wiped out. And Christ said, remember the examples of Noah and Lot, and, and that's uh, very helpful to think about. And he, uh, Peter even talks about that here. He goes through in uh, 2 Peter chapter 2. He talks about Noah in verse uh, 4 and 5. And then Lot in verse 6. And notice finally in verse, uh, verse 7. He delivered righteous Lot who was oppressed by the filthy conduct of the wicked. For that righteous man dwelling among them tormented his righteous soul from day to day by seeing and hearing their lawless deeds. And, and certainly, brethren, are we not tormented when we see what's happening, when we observe the direction of our society, when we see the suffering, when we see the deception, uh, 
when we see the chaos and the, the violence and the animosity that people have today, are we not disturbed? And do we not cry out for a time to come that is better and how grateful we can be that we know it's coming? They, um, he tormented his righteous soul from day to day by seeing and hearing their lawless deeds. Verse 9. Then the Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptations. Brethren, how encouraging is that? That in the context of Noah and Lot and their societies absolutely falling apart, God knows how to deliver his people. We don't have to be afraid. We don't have to worry. We need to be close to God. We need to walk with him. We need to think about our direction. We think, need to think about our example. We need to think about our, our conduct and our character and make sure that we are conforming ourselves to him. But we don't have to be distressed. Notice in Matthew chapter 25. Matthew 25 and verse uh, 24. I'm sorry, actually, uh, Matthew 24 and verse, uh, verse 45. Matthew 24, verse 45. Who then is a faithful and wise servant whom his master made ruler over his household to give them food in due season? Blessed is that servant whom his master, when he comes, will find so doing. Assuredly, I say to you that he will make him ruler over all of his goods. But if that evil servant says in his heart, my master is delaying his coming and begins to beat his fellow servants and to eat and drink with the drunkards, the master of that servant will come on a day when he is not looking for him at an hour that he is not aware of. Now stop and think about this for a moment. Isn't saying my master is delaying his coming, is not that not very similar to where is the promise of his coming that we read in 2 Peter? The only difference is these people actually knew the truth. These people actually knew that the master had said, watch and be ready for I'm coming. And they had an opportunity to prepare. And frankly, part of their preparation was not just sitting back and waiting, but actually getting involved in giving food and, and uh, food to the household of the master in due season. That, that's feeding the world. Brethren, what kind of food does this world need more desperately than the truth? What kind of food do people need in, in our home countries around the world and every other country where we may not yet have a, a presence in, than to teach them and help them to understand why our world is falling apart. And to teach them and help them to, to, to resist the, the temptation to, to listen to those who say, it's always been this way, there always will have been cycles, it's just another cycle. No, our time is unique. We're living in the last days. No, Christ is not going to come tomorrow or the next day. We know there are certain things that have to happen. But we also know that it's not going to be 100 years from now or 200 years from now because of these things that are happening. Notice in Luke chapter 21. So, we have a lot to be thankful for. We have a lot to be encouraged about, even though we find ourselves as a generation that is living in the last days. He says, don't despair. In fact, notice what Jesus said in Luke 21, verse 25. There will be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars and on the earth, distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring, distress and perplexity. People confused and distressed about what's going on. And yet this work has the answers for them. And all of us are a part of this work. As we 
pray for this work as we do whatever part we have in it as we faithfully support this work in every possible way that we, we can. We are providing the answers. God is providing the answers through, through us if we are faithful to him. Men's hearts failing them from fear and the expectation of those things which are coming on the earth. For the powers of the heavens will be shaken. And then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. But verse 28, notice. Now when these things begin to happen, look up, lift up your heads, because your redemption draws near. Brethren, we are getting close. Let's value the truth that God has given to us to understand. Let's value the church that he has allowed us to be a part of. Let's value the work that he has drafted us into so that we can help others that are not yet released from the bonds of Satan and, and deception and superstition and error. Let's be a part of the work we are living in the last days, and we've seen some very specific and concrete, unique things that are happening that show us we are in a unique time. So we have a great opportunity. Yes, it's a difficult time, and it's going to get more difficult, but we also have a fantastic opportunity to show ourselves faithful to God, and he will strengthen us as we look to him. So brethren, the question is, are we living in the last days? I think the answer should be obvious.